church. So I'm asking you, as I send you already the cacao, the announcement, and those who doesn't have cacao in the group with us, uh, to join us in this special performance with the kids' service to have a special uh, song for Christmas Eve. So December 24, uh, starts 7 p.m. We are in the third uh, position of this uh, performance. So please join us, and yes, we're gonna practice one more time after this service. And yes, we need a lot of help and a lot of voices. Doesn't matter good or bad. We need all your voices. And and yes, please help us to uh, present to our whole church and our participation as a part of this community in this Christmas Eve. And of course, we're gonna have also, as you see in the bulletin, our special. Christmas service on December 25 here at 11.30 as usual and uh, after the performance on Saturday <coughs> we traditionally have a, a fellowship time so we provide some special bread I ordered an Italian bread called the panettone I don't know if you have tried panettone before and we're going to have hot chocolate and we're going to have a farewell not farewell party but a brief uh, aloha to, to Walter who's going back for three weeks to home to renew his passport and renew his trains for a new year in Korea. So we're going to have a, a small party and he's going to fly the next day after Christmas. And yes, and we can enjoy the, the, the service of the, the Christmas Eve. And on Sunday we're going to have a, a special lunch on 25 after service here on Christmas Day. And, and we, yes, we're going to once again uh, have a special meal and, and special fellowship together uh, in TC. Uh, as you can see also the, the, the bulletin, this, I also prepared some reading for you uh, to discuss or to have a deep study about Christmas. So I'm going to pause every week what is Christmas all about and yes, uh, study the guide for discussion so you may uh, discuss later in the group or individually about what is the, the reason that we celebrate Christmas, why Christmas we have to celebrate uh, Christmas and, and that's a good uh, discussion for this month of December we think it's a year. Now let's go to our uh, message of today and we arrive to chapter 7 of Matthew as we uh, concluding the Sermon of the Mountain. <clears throat> um, I entitled this uh, sermon Spiritual Eye Drops. I don't know if you know what are eye drops. So in Korea you say Numur, Numur Yak, Numur Yak. So eye drops, uh, in Spanish we say Colibio, Colibio. So that's more medical term. But uh, in English I tried to find it, the, the translation and to say eye drop. I don't know if you have a, a medical terminology for eye drops. Yeah. Called the colorium, colorium, maybe because it's a Latin word. <laughs> but uh, yes, definitely we need some kind of medicine for our eyes. Why? Because we are just to see things as we think we are seeing things. But the problem is that sometimes the way we see things are not clear. Are not righteous. In order to study or to finish this uh, this study of the book of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mountain, you have to remember the key word. The key word is in chapter six, verse thirty-three. We already probably memorize this verse because I repeat it every week, and let's do it together without looking the the Bible. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all sins will be added to you. Now, in order to understand the Sermon of the Mountains, this is the key word in chapter 6, verse 33. The kingdom of God must be seek, and it must be seek His righteousness. So everything about the Sermon of the Mountains is pointing to only one thing, righteousness, the righteousness of God. So, from in order to understand chapter 7, we have to relate with chapter 6. And in order to understand chapter 7 and 6, we have to relate to chapter 5. So, the Sermon of the Mountains that we just studied, it started with what? With the Beatitudes. 
Remember the Beatitudes? So, the A Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes point us to be thirsty and hungry of righteousness. If we are thirsty and hungry of righteousness, then we, we, we're going to develop all these Beatitudes. Merciful, patient, peacemakers, kindness, and, 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 and humbleness. So, as we look for the kingdom of God, as we seek the kingdom of God, let us remember that we are approaching to righteousness. That is a demanding of walking in the steps of righteousness. In other simple words, we, not, we not have to approach to the Christian ethics. Christian ethics. The Beatitudes is the platform of Christian ethics. And now, as the chapter 7 is concluding the Sermon on the Mountain, Jesus is summarizing what he learned, what he said in chapter 5 and in chapter 6. He's making a summary. And he's summarizing here from verse 1 to 6. So that's why I took this portion of the Bible to, 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 to conclude this series of the Sermon on the Mountain. Because Jesus is summarizing, going back to what is important of life, the character. The character. The character of a Christian person. And the character of the Christian person have been related in the Christian ethics. And the ethics is just the way people live. And people will value and assess you according to the ethics that you have. There are many kinds of ethics. Scientists, they have ethics. Philosophers, they have ethics. Art people, they have ethics. But we Christians also, we have ethics. And that's why people value themselves according to their ethics and standards. <clears throat> and, and because we know that we have to live in righteousness and pursue righteousness and fix our eyes to righteousness, then we have to understand, we have to understand, be aware, and deepen in the knowledge of righteousness. In other words, to deep and study the Christian's standards. What are our standards of walking by faith, living by faith, and showing faith to the world? Because we are the soul of the air, we are the light of the world, then we need a form. We need an image. And this image doesn't come from us. It comes from God who is righteous. So we are following Jesus. We are imitators of Jesus. So we are imitating not to, to, to duplicate or to, to counterfeit Christians' life, but to be like Jesus. To be mature like Jesus. To be like Him in every ways. So, Christians are called to become like Jesus, who is the Son of God. And that's why God calls us, by the spirit of adoption, children of God. So, if we are following Christ, we are following our Heavenly Father. That means we are acting according to our Father, live, and I, and His. So, we are here to learn from this month how to finish well and how to continue our life next year. This year we are finishing and we have to realize what we have learned so far is not about us, it's about the kingdom. It's not about what we think, it's about what God sees. It's about His righteousness. And if we seek for His righteousness, we seek for His kingdom, we don't need to worry about the next year. Everything will be added to us. So, <clears throat> many people, they just try to interpret the chapter 6 of Matthew, or ch sorry, chapter 7 of Matthew, and especially the, the first verses, only studying this chapter. But as I say already, you have to understand this chapter or this teaching of Jesus here in chapter 7 with the whole Sermon of the Mount. You cannot separate this chapter 7 from the rest of the Sermon of the Mount. In order to have a right interpretation of this scripture, we have to relate what we have learned so far. 
And it's interesting that Jesus was talking about to how right way to see sins and how to relate with others and to show a good Christian ethics after he talked about no worries. Remember, we study about no worries in, in, in Christ. So Jesus said, after you know that God is your provider and he listens your prayers as he teaches the Lord's prayer, then he said, now look at your character. Look at how you're going to live by faith. And with eyes of it. <clears throat> so the scripture says today, very clearly, judge not that you be not judged. Now many people just take this verse, and even no Christians who doesn't who don't believe in God, they judge us with this verse. And they say, You Christians say you judge not and you are judging us. So they are judging them with the same verse that we are supposed to judge the world. We have this verse not just to avoid judgment. Jesus is not saying, and we have not here to interpret this verse literally, that we should not judge anything at all. Because everything that you do, when, from the moment that you wake up to the moment you go back to back, is judging and you are judging everything you are judging yourself you are judging people you are judging the world and you are judging every circumstances so it depends how you wake up and how the weather is and you are judging the weather so if today is rainy you just say oh it's gonna be a bad day so you already judge the day before the day started just because it's rainy oh is this it's hard you say oh it's gonna be a very hard day because it's too hot or gonna be too hot even before you go to bed you just judge the next day just looking at the broadcast news the weather condition and it, it's just a little sample of how we start to judge everything from every moment from the, from the moment that what are you gonna dress today okay if I dress this then I will look elegant or I will look ugly or I will look uh, strawberry or whatever so you are judging yourself. But this word that Jesus said, judge not, had not to be interpreted according to the dictionary, English dictionary. It had to be interpreted according to the Sermon of the Mount again. And Jesus was teaching to his disciples to not be like the hypocrites. He said that in the chapter 6. And he was referring to the hypocrites when he was talking about the Pharisees or the Sadducees because they like to show up to the world something that they are not or they pretend to be in order to look good but Jesus is warning us to not be hypocrites here in chapter 7 again and he said well I'm not saying that you should not judge but what I'm saying is that you should not be so critical to others without criticizing first yourself. We are teaching in our schools, and especially middle high school students, to have critical thinking. So how critical thinking is good. But to be critical to others without criticizing yourself, that is wrong. Because in that way you are judging others we know a right to judge. Right to judgment. So we are here to learn to judge according to Jesus and God's and kingdom's judgment. So Jesus is not forbidding us to judge the world. He's not forbidding us to judge others. He's not forbidding us to judge ourselves. Actually, we are trained to judge. And the scripture said that, so this is not from me. It says here in Matthew. Matthew chapter 19 and said, Then Peter answered to, and said to him, to Jesus, and said to Jesus, See, we have left all of, we have left all and followed you, talking to Jesus, therefore what shall we have? 
Peter asked, asking to Jesus. And so Jesus said to them, not only to Peter, but to all the disciples who were listening there, Assuredly, I say to you that I, in, that in the regeneration, the regeneration, when the sons of man is sit on the throne of his glory, you, and underline that is on purpose, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So Jesus was promising to his disciples that they're going to be judges. They're going to judge the world. They're going to judge the tribe and the people of Israel. So God is calling us and training us to be judged. Without judges in this war, this war would be chaotic. Anarchy would be anywhere. But because we have judges, because we have laws, then we rule the world. And the world in some way has an order. Even though there are some who try to break the rules, break the laws, and pass over the judges and the judgment of, the, of this world. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5 12, For what had I do with judgment those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are in, inside? In other words, Paul was telling to, to, to his followers and the members of the Church of Corinthians, you criticize the world, but the world has their own laws to criticize itself, to judge themselves. We have our laws in church to judge ourselves, not to criticize ourselves. So we have in church what is called a discipline. Discipline. So we have authorities and we must judge. If we see someone is doing wrong, especially in our community, in church, and it's affected the body of Christ that we have here in church, pastors, elders, they have the right to call that person and say, well, I see you are damaging the congregation with your actions, with your words, with your thoughts, or with your uh, movements that you are doing here. Giving a warning first. If he, that person insists, call him back again and then start a discipline. If the person insists, that person has to be excommunicated. Excommunicated means to say, him, please find another place because we think that your words, your actions, your attitude is not edifying. If that person repents and asks for forgiveness, then we consider again to include him in our church with a commitment to repair the damage. With a commitment to repair the damage. But if not, then we cannot hold a apple that is sick and put it in a basket of good apples that will be damaged sooner or later. The same way that is in the nature, it will be in the spirit. If you see a, a fruit that is already decayed, and you just leave it there next to the good fruits, that decayed fruits will influence the other fruits. And this infection or this decay will go beyond their skins of these fruits and will pass to the other fruits and then you will have an entire box or basket of fruits decayed. The same thing happened in a congregation. The same thing happened in our bodies. If we have a cancer, if somebody have a cancer, they have to stir up the cancer that way. You cannot live with the cancer because you know the cancer will grow, grow, grow until your body <coughs> will not hold anymore and you will die. Therefore, discipline in church is necessary. Judging brothers and sisters is necessary. But the question is, what kind of judgment we want to brought? What kind of discipline? How? And what are the ethics of judging? What standards we have to judge one another? 
Warren Bursby, in his book of Be Logical, following the King of Kings, the commentaries of Matthew, he says about kingdom principles. And he's talking about the principle of judgment. <clears throat> and he says that this chapter 7 teaches about three, or about true judgments. True judgments that we can learn from chapter 7. First, come from verse five, uh, 1 to 5, our judgment of ourselves. Then, from verse 6 to 20, our judgment for others. And from verse 21 to 29, God's judgment of us. So in this study, where we say that, yes, we are here to judge the world, but we have to start first judging ourselves. And he's developing this study in this way. As he said, yes, we are to judge ourselves. In verse 1, the Lord Jesus is telling us to, we shall be judged. As we just read, judge not that you be not judged. So we shall be judged first before we judge other. And because we judge first, we can be ready to judge others with the same judgment that we have received. And actually, many people, they judge others for what they experience. The problem is that we denied our judgment, I mean the judgment that we should receive, and we pass this judgment to others. And we start to criticize others, and we try to persecute other people, judging them, criticizing them, and complaining about them that when we know that when we see ourselves we are doing not only the same thing but even worse things than that but we try to avoid to judge ourselves first and then we just pass this judge to other people so we are not here to play God in other words to condemn others but this is exactly what the Pharisees did. They condemned, condemned other people in the world and they tried to justify themselves. And Jesus was teaching to his disciples to not judge because of these tendencies of the Pharisees to condemn everybody. They condemned the Gentiles. They condemned even the people of Israel who were unclean. And they condemned people who were sinners. And, and they, they try to, to kill them or stone them and punish them, even though in their hearts there were wars. Remember, the Sermon on the Mountains, Jesus talked about or, or rebuked again the Tenth Commandments. And he emphasizes more the law. He didn't break the law, he emphasized more and put the righteousness that deserved the law. And the law said, you shall not murder. But people even say, oh, I never murder. I, I, I criticize, I condemn those who kill others. But they hate people. They hate people. And Jesus said, well, just hating people is the same thing that you are killing someone. People were saying, oh, we are not adulterous. We don't have lavish eyes to see a woman or to see pornography. But Jesus said, even you just look at the woman and another person with a desire to be together. And this person have already someone or have, have a, a, a relationship, then you are adulterous too. So we, we see that Jesus is, is unveiling all hearts, all eyes. That try to, to be righteous in, in, in their own ways. Remember that our righteousness doesn't come from us, come from God. It's God who declares righteous for what Jesus has done, not for what we have done. We deserve to be condemned, we deserve to be punished, but Jesus took our punishment, Jesus took our condemnation, and He brought us righteousness. He dresses us with righteousness so we can stand, even though we are sinners, in front of God, and we can be here in front of the Holy Spirit, even though you don't see it, you don't feel it, with righteousness, because you are covered by the blood of the Lamb. 
and that's why we are here, even though you 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 are what you're looking at your cell phones or you are sleeping in the sermon or you are just coming and, 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 and doing any, anything else without any punishment because already Jesus did the punishment of you. And that's why many people abuse the grace of God. Abuse the grace of God. But if we have eyes open it and see that God is here and his all core of angels are here, then we're going to be a step forward and we're going to be in a right position and way to worship him with fear. Fear. We need solemn fear, no scary fear to worship him. We need to be realized that, yes, Jesus said, when two or three are getting together in, in, in my name, I will be there. So, you believe in the Bible, you believe in God, you believe in His promise, then if you believe in God, and I believe in God, and we get together today, this very day, in Jesus' name, right now, the Holy Spirit is here. Do you believe that? I believe that. I don't know about you. And I'm preaching in front of God, so God is right here in the, in the first lines. He will not cut my head after the sermon. For not preaching his word. So, of course, we say Jesus did not forbid us to judge others. Actually, Paul says in Philippians chapter 1 9 to 10, and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. All discernment. That you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So the Pope supposed to say, yes, you have the right to righteousness. You are training to, to, to uh, sorry, you're training to judge. You have the right to judge people because you need judgment or you need discernment. This word judgment is the same word in Greek, discernment. Because you cannot just come and listen every sermon and say, amen, 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 without thinking. Or following without discernment. Following, okay, what this pastor is talking about is really biblical or not? Actually, the, it's my apprentice, I hear that even in our church, there's a room. There is some kind of meeting. And this meeting is about people, they want to study the Bible. They have sincere heart. And they are studying the King James Version of the Bible. And they say that <clears throat> some pastors, and even our senior pastor, is not using the King James Version translation or the interpretation of the Bible. And therefore, what we are teaching is not correct. And one person, he say, I want to meet the senior pastor and tell them that he misinterpreted the Bible. Now we have a discussion, so we, okay, maybe he did that, but what is this intention to meet this new pastor? It's not just to say, oh, pastor, oh, you misinterpreted because King James Version said this, and you're using NLT version or, or NIV version, and your interpretation is wrong. There's something probably negative there, in the spirit of try to create a conflict. Because if I know that, or if you know me, I say something wrong, you will email me. And say, Pastor, I think what you say probably have a different meaning. And I will ask you that and say, oh, okay. I will reply, we discuss first probably by email, and then we, if this is need a deep conversation, we can have a, a coffee and drink together. That would be the natural way to deal with this thing. But this kind of group, I think, they have good intention, but they need some kind of guidance. Because we you just you know, can go to the authority and say, okay, you are wrong, this and that. That's a kind of spirit that needs to be discerned. And in the time of Jesus, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they tried to correct Jesus. To teach Jesus. And they said, what is this new teaching? You are breaking the law. And Jesus was not breaking the law. 
He was just putting the emphasis to the Lord. And Jesus used his own words. People judge not with intention to edify, but to, with the intention to demolish, to break something. And that's why many Christians are living Christianity. Many members are leaving church because this problem that is in church, and then if this is in church, how far would be in the world? And now, no Christians are judging us for no be loving one another, for no encourage one another, for fighting each other, and for no be more like Jesus. We need to be ready to judge others, but first we have to judge ourselves. So, First we say number two, we are here to judge ourselves, but we are being judged first. Verse two says, for which what judgment you judge? For which what judgment you judge? You will be judged, says the Lord Jesus. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So the same way that we judge, we'll be judged. The same measure that we use to judge others will be judged to us. And, and it's, it's interesting that we have a good parable to illustrate this. Remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 37 to 38. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down. Shaking together and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So that's a very good explanation of what we have here in Matthew. And this, this work comes after Jesus was telling this parable of the servants who they didn't manage well their debts. Remember? And the same thing that happened in chapter 6 in Matthew. After Jesus was talking about money, then he said, no judge. And people these days, they are judging because there is a spirit of mammon over there. They're, they try to influence everybody. And you can see this war, that they, especially this Christmas time, they are judging because they say, oh, they're going to have this for Christmas? I, wanna, I want to have that too. They're going to change this for New Year. I'm going to change that too. And this is the time when people, they say, well, renovation. But instead of renovation, it's not renovation. It's not that, okay, these things are all in my life. And I want something uh, better or new. But it's just coveting. It's just comparing to the neighbor. Oh, he have this expensive car. I want to have this expensive car. He have this expensive apartment. I want to have this same apartment too. There are... Working in, the, in, in, in this kind of uh, uh, place, I want to work in that kind of company too. And, the, and with this regard what we have, we disvalue what we have, and we start to criticize those who have better than us because with our own effort, we can have it. We can hold it. And we try to, to, to use money to pretend to be what we are not. And we use money to, from the bank to have a better apartment and then we have a bad debt later and we have a, 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 a we, we are using our credit cards to have better shoes or better, better uh, facilities or, or, or things that we need for life and we are accumulating a debt and then at the end of the, the day what we have at the bottom of the line is just a big debt why? because we start to judge one another so starting with judging and finish with money and you are in, in, in certain scan of it. Number three, we must see clearly to help each other. Verse three and five says, <clears throat> and why do not look at the speak in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plan in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speak from my eye and look at the plans in your own eye. Hypocrite. 
First, remove the plant from your own eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the speak from your brother's eye. So what the Lord Jesus is teaching us here is first, the purpose of self-judgment. So we are here to judge our first self because with self-judgment we are ready to serve others. Our judgment is not to kill people, is not to damage people, is not to destroy people's life or reputation or relationship, but is to let them grow in faith and in grace. As I said, we have discipline in church, and this discipline is in order to grow the brother or sister in repentance to grow in faith in a relationship with the rest of the body of Christ. If that person is a real Christian, he will be convinced and will be also uh, touched by the Holy Spirit in repentance and be back to the congregation. And the congregation will be ready to love him back, to embrace him in grace and continue life like normal. So we are here to be trained to judge ourselves in order to serve the, the rest of the body of Christ. The Pharisees, the Pharisees, they judge and criticize others to make themselves look good. Not to, to let other people grow. Not to make other people be a better God's people. But they just want to look, to make a difference between, okay, you are sinners, you are tax collectors, you are prostitutes, we are holy people. And they walk in one way, they pray in another way, and they give money in another way that people can see and they, well, they can receive blood from everybody and praise from everybody. Jesus said they already have what they deserve. Just clap and praise. They will have nothing else in the kingdom of God. But the rest who knows that they were accused, criticized, pointed as sinners, that's collector, prostitutes, or any other kind of separation from these sets, they repent and they were restored to God's kingdom. Christians instead, of, we judge ourselves so that we can help other people look good. If we judge ourselves, then I'll say, okay, you commit a mistake. I don't agree with that. But let me think first. If I would be you, if I own your step, Will I do the same thing or not? These days, this country is very noisy. Our country is very noisy because now I'm Korean, it's in my country. Our country is very noisy. And you know why. And people are going every day, demonstrating, and try to raise their hands and voices for justice. Justice must be done and exercise the, uh, their claim. Now, let me ask you this question. Because I asked myself this question. If I would be this woman or this president and I would be in the same situation, will I not be tempted to do the same thing? If you would be the president of Korea and if you would be in the same situation, Will you be different? You will say in the first word, yes, of course. Hmm. But in your deep heart, let me see if you didn't want it to be the same thing. Many people who are now demonstrating outside and asking for the president to resign, they already and they are still doing the same thing. In other terms. In other terms. Companies, the schools, they are all the same. Every, in every sphere of this society, everybody is doing the same thing. But we don't judge ourselves. We judge the president, we judge the people. Why? Because they are public. It's more easy to see. People judge me all the time because I'm a leader. I'm a pastor. And that's why 
My philosophy is just one. I just want to show you Noah, holy pastor. Noah pastor that walks on clouds because I come from a country and I was Catholic. I told you many times, I was Catholic. And I was growing in a Catholic country and when I first heard about Protestant or Evangelicals, the picture I saw about pastors, they were very holy people. They walk in one way, they talk in one way, and they say, wow, that's untouchable. They call it the servant of God. They call it the, 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 the anointed one. And they perform miracles and then... So I, I, I couldn't accept Christianity in my country when I was young. So I was all already a, a Christian as a Catholic, so I just continued with my religion. But I couldn't accept uh, the hypocrisy that religious leaders have. Because they want to perform one way and then they try to teach us to live in one way and they live in another way. And that's why I reject my religion. And Say, okay, I was gonna follow what the Bible said instead of my people. And then when I came back to Korea, and when I came to Korea, I was 26 years old, and I saw Korean people with sincere heart, worshiping God, with all their heart and praying to God and, and, and pour out their hearts to God. But I say, I want to do the same thing. I don't, I don't, don't want to just follow our religion. But I'll have a conflict. I was Catholic. More Christian country than Catholic in those days. These days it's reverse. We have more Catholics than what the Sunday says. And I just want to, I want to, I just say, I want to know their God. I want to experience what they experience. Probably my heart, my heart was ready for that. And I prayed to God, okay, God, is this the right way? And I, I, I opened the scripture, and God, in my meditation and in my reading time, that is time to speak to my heart. And then I said, okay, I want to know more. I went to every Sunday's sermon that we were preaching in Korea, and everything was clear. Everything was understandable. And I never heard a preach in my, in, in my or a father, Catholic father in my country, preaching in that way. It was just religious. It just was appearance. It just was a formalism. Nothing that can relate to my life. But then I came and, and listened to this word and said, God, I want to know more. I want to hear more. I want to I wanna accept more of you. I want to be filled with more of your word. And then it started my process of changing. But as I said last week, I was never a good person. I was never a, a, a holy person. And I criticized the, the, the people who can every every week knock in my door and say, we are, we are Jehovah Witness, or we are Mormon, or we are Evangelicals. I said, get out, I'm Catholic. I reject religious people. I never tried to be a religious person. But now I have a conflict. Now I believe in God. Now I, I, I believe in the Bible. What should I do? And, and as soon as God called me to be a pastor, I said, well, I have another conflict. I hate religious people. And I want to become one of them? No way. And then I said, okay. God... If you call me to be a pastor, I'm going to be a pastor, but I'm never going to change the way I am. I mean, I'm going to change my bad behavior, I'm going to change my, 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 my cost, uh, senior life, but I want to change the person that you made me. My, my enthusiasm, my Latin brother, sex appeal. You know, I want to be the same person. I don't want to become a, 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 a stick person just or try to walk on, on clouds if I is that not happen. And people criticize me because of that. I say, oh, oh you pastor make jokes, for example. Because I like to make jokes. I, just, I, like, I like to laugh with people. And because I laugh with people they I mis I misunderstand because oh you are not serious. Laughing doesn't mean I'm not serious. Or people say, oh, you are not a holy person. Yeah. Why? Because I just go probably to, to drink coffee or do the other things like, like normal people do. Why do I do that? 
Because I, I want to show to the world, if God reached a person like me to be in his holy ground, you who are better than me, why cannot you get to God? If you are better than me, why don't you accept God as your Savior and, 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 and friend? He will lead you in, in, in a good pastors to, to have peace and provide for all your needs. God did it in my life. I'm the testimony of God's work. What you see here is not me. I didn't do this. It was God. And God blessed me so much in this country for 20 years. I had the righteousness to stand out here and say, yes, if you believe in God, if you trust in God, God will support you. And you don't need to be holy first in order to be blessed by God. It's why you are being blessed by God that you are walking in holiness and you are approaching more to His righteousness. We are here to help each other. But we have to start to judge ourselves. The Pharisee, one day, Jesus was talking this part about one of the Pharisees, he went to pray to the temple and said, God, I know like this text collectors, producers, or even this person who is here, text collector. I tie, I do this, I do that, and I'm okay. Bless me, God. But the other person who was a tax collector, he just was a, a far, a little far away from the other one, and he said, God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I'm a sin. The tax collector said the scripture, standing afar off, will would not so much repent of his sin as the other person or text collector who raised his eyes to heaven. And after he raised his eyes to heaven, he said, Be merciful of me, I'm a sinner. Jesus said to us, Why did you look at the speak of your brother's eye? But do not consider the plan in your own eye. Because we don't look at heaven. If you look up to heaven first, you will see you have a plan in your eyes. A very big plan in your eyes. This morning, we all need a spiritual eye drop. We need to look at heaven. And when you look at heaven, you will know that you will be condemned for what you have done. But as soon as you look at heaven, you can, and you seek for righteousness, you will meet righteousness. Righteousness is not a noun. It's not a vocabulary. It's a person. Jesus is the righteousness of God. So when you look at heaven, you will see the plank in front of you. That is the plank of the wood of the cross of Jesus. And you need to look at the heaven. When the cross of Jesus is pointing out to your final destination. If you look at the, part, the, the plank of the cross of Jesus, definitely you will experience the spiritual eye drop. The tears of Jesus on the cross will clean your eyes and see the world with God's eyes. We are here to be watching and clear our ears and eyes and hearts and body and everything that we are with the blood of Jesus. But our eyes are first. Why? Because our eyes are the most sensitive part of our body. And if God touch our eyes and let us see Jesus in the scripture, in other people's life, in this world that needs mercy and love, then we will remove this plant from this world and we can also be able to remove the stick or anything that is blinding our 
brothers, friends, and everybody in this world. The scripture said in Hebrews 12, 12, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For who he, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Set out your eyes upon Jesus. He's on the throne. He's ready to judge the world. He will come to judge the living and the dead, as we say in the Apostle Creed. But if you look up right now to Jesus, you can receive the grace, the eye drop, water of the Spirit in your eyes to see the world as Jesus sees it. To see this world as you need to see it. How many of you need to receive this water? This cleaning water in your eyes so you can see Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and He will clear your eyes to see others. And you will start to judge yourself first. You will judge others to edify them, not to destroy them, not to criticize them, but to help them to grow in faith, to be restored in the family of Christ, to be restored in the relationship with God first and then with one another. And we can all go to the faith and make this Christianity in this world stronger and ready to teach the next generation. So why don't we bow our heads this morning. And we remember that Jesus came 2,000 years ago, not just to celebrate the Christmas time, but to judge the world with his coming. He will come again, sooner or later, to judge the living and the dead. Let us be ready. To not condemn the world, but to help the people understand that God's judgment is ahead. And we can all be part of of his grace as we look at the, the cross of Jesus and fix our eyes to him who is merciful, who is full of grace and full of righteousness. In Jesus' name. Let's pray. Now we thank you today for giving us this opportunity to worship you again and to worship you with all our hearts.